Joining me on this and a million other things as it relates to vaccines and coronavirus, uh, we always enjoy talking to Phil Kirpin about this because he is a repository of information and uh, we are, and he's dedicated to it. We appreciate it. He's president of American Commitment and the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. Phil, always good to see you. Thanks so much. Why Great. is that, though? Why why is it if we are following the science? Why is why does the science then lead one country to have a different conclusion regarding masking kids in schools while the United States thinks, oh, we have to do that here, even though numerous studies shows show that they it doesn't actually reduce the, the transmission? Well, the U.S. is a really extreme outlier on the masking of children. Uh, no other country, uh, may, maybe maybe Japan, um, but I'm, I'd have to check on that. But certainly no country in Europe uh, masks down to age two like the United States does. The youngest children that get masked in Europe uh, are from age six, and that's only in three countries. That's Italy, Spain, and France. The rest of Europe either masks not at all or they mask from age 12. And actually, if you look at the World Health Organization recommendations, they say do not mask under age six and you know consider it under age 12, but there are other considerations and you might not want to. They have a very sort of mixed recommendation. And what we saw in the United Kingdom, uh, Dana, where they have never masked under age 12 and they got rid of even masking over age 12 uh, in May, they actually had lower school cases in their Delta wave and they had a very large Delta wave while schools were in mm -hmm. session, uh, you know, the largest in the world. They actually had lower school cases during their Delta wave with no masks than they had uh, in the winter with the Alpha wave. And so uh, there's just no good evidence supporting masking school children, certainly not younger school children, but I, I don't really think the evidence is very strong for the older kids. And yet we have it in this country and the only answer is politics and in particular, uh, we found out yesterday, probably not surprising to you or your audience, that the day before the current Mask All the Kids guidance came out of CDC, uh, the CDC director was asked by the White House uh, director of union engagement to talk to the heads of the two largest teachers unions in the country, Becky Pringle and Randy Weingarten, and she talked to both of them on the phone, and then the next day put out that guidance. Now. They didn't put it in writing this time like they did with when they were dictating the previous round back in February. They did it over the phone, but it's pretty clear uh, that this was not a science-based guidance. It was something that came from the teachers' unions. Yeah, and and that's and again, that's not that's political, as you said. That's not science. That's that's politics, and it's just odd that that's. I, I, it's weird to me that we have such a conversation about uh, uh, about how the unvaccinated should be treated in terms of civility when it's very difficult to trust some of these agencies that are giving us this information when so clearly politics weighs so heavy into the decision making process. You had also you had something very interesting, too, ahead of Biden's remarks, which everyone's anticipating. He said uh, I think Jen Psaki and others with the White House have said it's going to be a discussion on coronavirus and covid vaccine. And where maybe we'll find out if there's mandates. I know they were talking about a third dose. And you had said that it was interesting that that's something that the president is, is pushing, considering the FDA just had two resignations in protest over having a third vaccine. Tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah, this happened last week. Uh, and, you know, if this had happened during a Republican administration, you wouldn't have seen anything else for the last week, except, you know, what a scandal it is and maybe he should be impeached over it and what have you. Uh, but it was a one day story at best, uh, if even that. In fact, the network news, I don't think even mentioned it at all. Uh, but basically, look, Biden, uh, the, the White House people said, we're going to start doing third doses uh, September 20th, I think was the date they set. And the top two officials at the FDA who work on vaccines, including the top official who'd been there, I think, 35 years or so, uh, quit. Basically, they didn't publicly say the reason, but they went to reporters and unnamed sources explained their reasoning. It was probably the people themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, her deputy quit as well. And basically, the unnamed source explained, the, you know, you can't conduct science at an agency when the outcome's already been determined by political people in the White House. And that's essentially what the Biden administration did, is they said, we're going to do these third doses, and the FDA is going to come back and tell us that it's safe and effective and it's a good idea. Well, if you're the vaccine division at the FDA, you can't do science under that circumstance where the outcome has already been determined for you by political people. And so they said, great, we're done. And they resigned. The top two uh, vaccine officials at the FDA both resigned uh, in, in the wake of that announcement from the White House. And it's really a bad situation now, Dana, because, you know, there are really only two possibilities here. One is 
that we don't need a third dose, in which case this whole exercise is political and a waste of time and mm -hmm. could be dangerous, or we do need a third dose, but by the time the FDA reaches that conclusion, no one will have any confidence in it because they won't know if that was the real conclusion of the science or just something that was directed politically. And so we've got a situation here where we're never gonna quite be sure whether the FDA was really doing honest science on this or just following political marching orders. And that's that's such a that's the big problem. As you're talking with Phil Kirpin, uh, who's been uh, just a, a great source of information on everything related to coronavirus and vaccine. And that's the I mean, that's the that's the big problem. That's the elephant in the room, so to speak. Well, but we're actually talking about it. We're not ignoring it. But it's it's the heavy politicization of this. And as you said, the outcome already determined. And so the science, the scientific method kind of is thrown out the window, whatever best fits this prescribed outcome, that's that's following the science now. Now to this, there's another issue, of course, that was making the rounds late yesterday. And it has to do with a study that has been commissioned, uh, $1.6 million, I think it is, for this study uh, that's going into the effects of the vaccines on a woman's cycle not to i apologize to all the men out there we have to have this conversation i'm <laughs> sorry phil but we gotta have this conversation this has been something that we've heard a lot of women discussing and it they weren't getting answers whether it was from the cdc or nih or anywhere else they weren't hearing if dr fauci answer this question or even rochelle Bolinsky over at cdc so there was a lot of discussion a lot of reporting of this issue women who noticed that their cycles were entirely disrupted as a result of the vaccine now i know it's not unusual because i i, I believe that there was a previous study about hpv vaccines and how this might affect women's cycles but I, with this being so different and so new and that so many women are reporting similar reactions, it, it kind of amazes me that it's only just now being done because none of this was taken into consideration with early reporting. And doesn't this, it, it kind of a two-part question, don't you also think that this is kind of justification for why so many people are still hesitant? Because it's not that they're anti-vax, it's that they want to make sure that they're, they're making the most informed decision. And doesn't that kind of sort of justify their hesitation a bit? Well, right. I think that uh, to, to your first question, this definitely should have been commissioned earlier as soon as people were reporting. You know, as soon as these vaccines were rolling out, we had women saying that they, they skipped a period or they were late or whatever it was. Uh, you know, maybe that's nothing. Maybe it normalizes after. Maybe it has no impact on fertility or anything else. Yeah. But you, know, you need to study it. You can't right. just make assumptions. You need to run the study. And I'm glad they are finally running it. But yeah, this could have been started six months ago. There was no reason for them to wait this long. And to your second point, uh, look, anytime you've got new technology, one of the things people are going to be concerned about are not just the known side effects, which we know are very rare, uh, but the unknown. And particularly, is there anything long term that you might not know about? And, you know, it's one thing if you're a senior, you probably aren't, don't have to worry about the long term that much. The near term benefit is so large, it's almost certainly going to outweigh those unknowns. And that's probably why we have 90 percent uptake among seniors is they've done that risk benefit calculation, uh, including potential unknowns. You get younger and your COVID risk is much, much lower. And you start to think maybe, well, you know, my, if I get COVID, I'll probably be fine anyway. And we, there's still unknowns about the vaccine. So I do think that's where you get a lot more hesitation among younger people who sort of the benefit is not nearly as clear to them because the COVID risk is much lower. And it's not just the known risks, which are very low, but you know what unknown risks might be out there. And maybe I'll wait until more studies are done. I don't think that's an illogical or irrational way for people to think about this stuff. And I think we should stop denigrating people uh, who are hesitant on the basis of just the, the what are the unknown issues here? Right. Because that's always a possibility. And, you know, I think we should just be honest about laying out the the known uh, benefits, the known and unknown risks and, and let people make their decisions instead of this heavy handed approach that we're expecting from the president tonight. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. We're talking with Phil Kirpin, uh, who is who's followed all of this with vaccines and, and all, all throughout the actually the, since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think a lot of people are so much more knowledgeable because of the work, Phil, that you've done. You now, to that point, you know, as that affects women, there were there were also the reports of you know young men who we're dealing with. And I realize, you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm definitely not anti-vax. I, and I've told people I haven't received it because of a health issue that I was actually waiting. I'm actually one of those people that's waiting on this study um, to waiting to see what, what that, because of some health issues with that. And, but I but at the same time, I don't want to get coronavirus and I don't want to have respiratory issues and all of that. It's not at all a political stance. 
but there there are some questions that, for instance, I, I'm talking to some mom friends of mine who have uh, boys between the ages. I think it's like 18 to 25. And there were the reports of the myocarditis and pericarditis. Have you uh, have you come across anything that would suggest if there is is there some sort of a genetic predisposition that would make an otherwise healthy person more prone to an, a reaction like that? Has the CDC released anything? Yeah, we're we're not really sure what uh, the risk factors might be for those cardiac events uh, in in younger men in particular. There was a, a new preprint that came out yesterday from a team uh, led by uh, Dr. Tracy Hogue, who was the lead author of the CDC Wisconsin study school study. So pretty pretty prominent uh, author, and and the preprint that her team put out yesterday found a pretty high risk of. Uh, a pretty high rate of, of myocarditis and pericarditis uh, in younger men, higher than previous publications that found, I think that, that she found it was about one in 6,200 uh, following a second dose. And, you know, that's not like one in 10. It's still pretty rare. One in 6,200 right. is not super common. Uh, but relative to the COVID risk in that age group, it, it's considerable. And so, you know, I do think that particularly if people have, uh, you know, someone in their family who's in that sort of young male range, I really would encourage talking to your doctor about potentially delaying or even skipping the second dose. Uh, almost all of the benefit is going to come from the first dose anyway, and almost all of the cardiac adverse event risk comes following the second dose from what we've seen uh, in the studies. Uh, if you do, for what, if you do go ahead with the second dose on a short schedule or for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's not, uh, we haven't had any deaths with these cardiac issues with young men, uh, but you do need to be aware of it. And so it typically happens within two weeks after that second dose. So be aware, be aware if you've got rapid heartbeat, be aware if you've got trouble breathing, anything, you know, that might be a red flag and, and get appropriate medical care if that happens. But mm -hmm. it's, not ex it's not extremely common, uh, but it does appear that it's not quite as rare as the CDC had suggested. Yeah, and we're talking with Phil Kirpin. Um, two, two final questions for you here, Phil, and we appreciate your time with us today. The... Uh, vaccination rate, I think it's something like 200 million Americans have received the, the vaccine. And as you noted, too, you know, you have rare side effects. But if you're one of those rare people, that's something that, you know, you're concerned about. And it's, it's understandable for people to have questions. Then there's the discussion, too, of uh, this 300 percent some odd increase in cases. Now, we know that's from where at least it's been attributed to the Delta variant. And we keep hearing a pandemic of the unvaccinated, etc. Is it are we looking at this vaccine incorrectly? I mean, are we using the wrong word? You have inoculation, you have vaccine, you have therapeutics. I, I am totally fine with people. Obviously, they can make their own choices if they want to uh, reduce the severity of symptoms. But is it because the vaccine is behaving in this case because it can mutate and we can't keep up with those mutations that way, just kind of like with the common cold? Is 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 that is that really ultimately what's driving it? And because this is more of a therapeutic, is that is that the correct way to address that? Well, I I don't think that we're really seeing a lot of sort of mutations driven by vaccine pressure or anything else. The dominant variant that we're seeing all over the world and you know really everywhere in the U.S. it's ninety nine percent plus of all the COVID we're seeing now is Delta variant, um, and of course that originally arose you know almost a year ago, it yeah. originally arose. Uh, so it's not brand new, it arose in India, I think October or November of last year. And so it's not a new variant, but it does seem to have a, a transmission advantage over the other variants. It's more infectious. Uh, it's not more dangerous, but it's more infectious and that's allowed it to spread much more readily. And you know, one of the things that we're seeing with the vaccines and with Delta and some very interesting UK data on this just came out today, actually, they found that uh, between the ages of 40 and 79, they actually have a higher case rate among the vaccinated than the unvaccinated. Much, much lower hospitalizations and deaths, but a higher case rate, higher rate of testing positive uh, in those age range, which is a pretty big age range yeah. uh, uh, among the vaccinated than the unvaccinated. So I think what's happening, uh, Dana, is the vaccines are very effective for preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And so from an individual standpoint, they're very protective, but we're not seeing a lot of societal population-wide protection because they're just not very right. effective against developing, you know, an infection and being infectious and passing it on. And so vaccinated people are getting the virus, they're passing it on, they're infecting with others, they're not getting very sick. And in fact, if you think about it, 
that may make them in some context more likely to pass it on because if you're not feeling very sick, yeah, you're then probably you think, less likely to stay home. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my goodness. Phil Kirpin, I had one more. It was just about the, the speech tonight, whether we're going to see a mandate. I know we have one for federal employees. We're going to have to have you back. We are out of time at this point. But Phil Kirpin, so appreciate it. Folks, you, I've retweeted him, so you can find him on Twitter quite easily. And he, it's just a, a plethora of knowledge. Phil, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Right. Have a good one. You too. Take care. Take care.